The Death of John the Baptist King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Hi, usually I would say how lovely it is to be preaching, uh, but that is until I saw the passage uh, for today, which is John the Baptist beheaded. Um, I found out on Tuesday that this was the gospel reading and I've been trying to work out what to say about John the Baptist and his grisly demise. It's not exactly one of the texts you get excited about preaching, but let's see what we can pull out. Okay, well our passage of scripture follows on from verses 6 to 13 where Jesus sent out the 12 disciples and they've been preaching and performing miracles in the region and it is this activity that King Herod hears about in verse 14. It says, causing people to speculate who is behind it all, perhaps Elijah or the great prophets of old. But King Herod on hearing this news believes, okay, it might be John the Baptist raised from the dead. And then the gospel writer Mark segues into the story of how John was beheaded. Now, why does Mark do this? Why does he go to the trouble of telling us this gruesome story? None of the other gospel writers go into such detail. Why does Mark? It seems a bit random, doesn't it? Well, what's happening here is that Mark is introducing a Markan sandwich, or more technically uh, called an interpretive incalculation. Oh, intercalation, sorry. This is a form of literary device that inserts one narrative episode between two parts of another. It's like putting a filling inside two pieces of bread, hence the name of Mark and Sandwich. And the two bits that this story is squeezed between are to do with discipleship. You see, this whole section of Mark's gospel is Jesus teaching his disciples what true discipleship entails. So this passage is not so much about John the Baptist per se, even though it describes his death, but it's designed to point to some aspects of discipleship. That's what I want you to catch. It's designed to help us conform our lives to the image of Christ. It is designed to help us become better followers of Jesus, better disciples. So, with that understanding, let's see what we can glean from the text. How the first thing that becomes apparent is that Herod fears John the Baptist. Okay, he feared John the Baptist while he was alive and is clearly troubled about him even after he's dead. He's a bit spooked out by him. You've got to ask a question, why would that be the case? Well, some of you might remember the story we tell at Advent, uh, the passage about John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. And when Mark first introduces John at the beginning of his gospel, which we look at at Advent, he says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Look at what he's preaching. He's preaching a baptism of repentance. Now, if we fast forward to the verses immediately preceding our passage, the verses that cause Herod to become fearful, it says, they, the disciples, went out and preached that people should 
repent. There's that word again, repent. The reason Herod feared John the Baptist whilst he was alive and still feared him when he was dead was because of the message he preached, a message that went beyond the grave, a message of repentance. And what Herod's response demonstrates is that everyone has a conscience. Fallen and corrupted as humanity is, there are thoughts within us, thoughts that can make even kings like Herod restless and afraid. In terms of discipleship then, repentance is something we ought to embrace. It is not something we should avoid or hide from. One of the things I love about common worship is that repentance is a key part of our liturgy. We, we did it earlier uh, in the service. In fact, if worship is done well, it should lead us to repentance regularly. It says in Romans that God's kindness leads us to repentance. So true discipleship requires sincere repentance That's the first point I think Mark is trying to make. Okay, let's move on. We know Herod feared John, but what's interesting is that Herod also appears to admire John. Take a look at verse 20. It says, For Herod feared John, we know that, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. Even though Herod feared John, It says here that he knew he was a righteous and holy man. It says he heard him and in fact he even liked to listen to him. But there was one thing that Herod would not do. He would not cease from adultery. He would not give up Herodias. So verse 18 we read that for John had been telling Herod it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. That's Herodias. So despite his fondness for John, listening and even liking what he had to say, there's one particular sin in Herod's life that he wouldn't give up. A sin he would not repent of. A sin that would ruin his soul forevermore. So what can we glean from this in terms of discipleship? Remember the Mark and Sandwich. I think this illustrates how easy it is to like what we hear at church or read in the Bible and yet still cleave to a favourite vice. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis tells the story of a ghost who turns up at the pearly gates with a little red lizard on his shoulder, and the cute little lizard keeps whispering evil and temptations into his ear. So the angel at the gate offers a deal with uh, the lizard, which which the ghost, about the lizard, sorry, uh, which the ghost is happy to accept. But when the ghost learns that the angel intends on killing the lizard, he changes his mind. You see, the lizard had become too hard to part with, even though the angel said he knew how to deal with it. It is literally a pet transgression. Herod was unable to relinquish this one sin, the sin of adultery, in his life. Now, now it's easy to point fingers at Herod, but how often do we hold on to pet transgressions ourselves? Have a think about it for a moment. Okay, I'm reminded of today's psalm, which I shared earlier in song. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. What are the pet transgressions in your life? It might not be adultery, but it could be another hidden sin or attitude or red lizard. And yet what does Jesus say in Matthew 5? He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your whole body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So the second point Mark is making is that true discipleship means not holding on to secret sin, allowing it to become an idol in our lives. That's the second point. Okay. We've talked a fair bit about Herod, but the other main character in this story is Herodias, the king's unhappy partner in iniquity, his brother's wife, whom he is having an adulterous affair. Here's a painting of Herodias on the left, mutilated, mutilating the severed head of John the Baptist, which is being held on a platter by Salome, her daughter, who, as we read, danced and then made the request to Herod. Now, Herodias seems to have sunk even deeper into sin than Herod. Hardened and seared in conscience by her wickedness, she hated John the Baptist for his faithful testimony. I wouldn't rest until she had procured his death. Verse 19, and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Herodias really had it in for John the Baptist and wanted him dead. And we need not wonder at this. When men and women like Herodias have chosen their line and justified their own wicked ways, they dislike anyone who tries to convince them otherwise. They are irritated by opposition. They are angry when they are told the truth. 
The prophet Elijah was called a man that troubled Israel. The prophet Micah was hated by Ahab. As you seek to follow Jesus as a faithful disciple, there will be those who will speak against you, even revile you, or even plot against you, as Herodias did. But again, what does Jesus say this time in Luke 6.26? Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. What Mark is communicating through this story is that being a disciple is costly. Being a disciple and speaking the truth will inevitably attract criticism and even vitriol. But that is one of the costs of proclaiming the gospel. Discipleship is costly and it will offend people. And that's the third point. Now in the story, we read that Herodias does get her way in the end. An opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias, Salome, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I'll, get, and I'll give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I'll give you even half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, Herodias, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on the platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of his regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. I'm not going to comment too much about revelry here, but clearly Herod is having a wonderful time celebrating his birthday and it's likely he has a, he's had a bit too much drink for his own good. And in a moment of excitement, he grants Salome's request to have the head of John the Baptist cut off. Now what? I do want to focus on is this, verse 26. It says, the king was deeply grieved. So Herod realised that he had been stitched up here and he is grieved. He doesn't want to give the order to execute John. We learned earlier that he actually admired and wanted to protect him, didn't we? So why does Herod not refuse Salome? Why does he not step in? Well, it says, yet out of regard for his oaths, so the promise he makes to Salome, and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Clearly, Herod has been tricked and doesn't want to break his word, but we see he also cares what his guests might think. Think, And if we refer to the very beginning of a passage, we learn that the guests are courtiers, officers and leaders of Galilee. So Herod doesn't do what is right because he doesn't want to look bad in front of these influential people. He cares too much about what they think. He doesn't want to look bad in front of them. Even in his grief, he is motivated by people and motivated by pride. Sorry. And this is the final point concerning discipleship that I want to pull out. True discipleship requires steadfastness and humility. Despite realising he's made a grievous mistake, he is too proud to admit it. He caves into the pressure. He didn't want to look bad in front of his guests. He caves into the pressure. His pride gets the better of him. And of course, he knows what the right thing to do is because he's grieved. And yet he is not strong enough to resist the will of Salome and Herodias. How often do we give in to the temptation to please others rather than pleasing the Lord? These are all lessons I believe Mark is drawing our attention to by sharing this story. And then we learn elsewhere in Mark's gospel the destructive power of pride and how it can derail our walks with the Lord. So in closing, the story of John the Baptist being beheaded is presented to us as a Mark in sandwich, providing some filler to complement Jesus' teachings, wider teachings on discipleship through this grisly retelling. And we learned that number one, true discipleship requires repentance. Number two, true discipleship does not hold on to secret sin. Number three, true discipleship is costly and will offend wrongdoers. And number four, true discipleship requires steadfastness, steadfastness to resist the opinions of others and the humility to admit when we've made a mistake. Jesus taught his followers what true discipleship looked like. He knew the trials and temptations they would face after his death, resurrection and ascension. He was preparing them for the days to come. And what's wonderful is that we can still learn from the Messiah today by studying his word and allowing the Holy Spirit to continue teaching and moulding us into the image of Christ, both as individuals and the church. Amen.